Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea podcast. We are coming at you with a new episode of our national retrospective because we have talked about the debut record and the sophomore record. We talked about the self-titled and sad songs for Dirty Lovers, and now we are talking about 2005's Alligator. I think that most people would sort of consider this to be the definitive arrival, this band sort of cementing their identity and etching into the, the, the scribes and lexicons cons of the musical future that the national are a band that is going to be around for a while absolutely um i wouldn't say this was their like first universal critical hit but it definitely was widely embraced and put them on a wider stage than either of their previous albums had and felt generally like the realization of a lot of potential, even if they hadn't quite found their exact identity in the cultural realm of indie rock yet. This is their second collaboration with Peter Catus, of course, uh, a long time collaboration with one of indie rock's most legendary producers who has had a huge part in coming to define the sound of this band. Uh, this record was released in April of 2005. Uh, this was an era where essentially the band were starting to realize a confidence that was leaned into on the first half of their last album but not quite fully coherently formed there yet no spoilers here i guess but alligator is my favorite national album and i don't see that changing in the course of this retrospective it's super uh set in stone even if there are many multiple many 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 records that i consider up in that upper echelon of my favorite albums alligator is top of the pile in many ways it feels like one of the most dangerous uh, and edgy national records in a certain sense one of the least filtered i mean we talked about how those first two records can be really uncomfortable with the level of like outward self-loathing and sort of general angst that pervades them uh, alligator feels like it distills that and finds a way to express it that is less uncomfortable and more kind of almost alluring than it was on the previous two records um, also it's worth noting as well that some of the signs of the compositional complexity that were starting to show on that last record with songs like cardinal song for instance get more fully realized here and you get a general set of indie rock songs that stick to a reasonably clear rock band template but also give you enough extra to kind of have the songs linger in your head and almost be a little bit difficult to fully connect with the first time just because they don't quite do what you expect them to do or they just have weird elements thrown into them like uh, an unusual time signature on the chorus which you get on lit up and mr november or and just generally sort of leaning into this little more arpeggiated guitar tone overlays of guitars and pianos and drums and more intensity in the playing in general as well that makes it feel quite different august i know this is a record that has come to be a particular favorite of yours uh even though hilariously i think it's still the only national record you've heard uh, uh correct what is the appeal if you had to kind of sum it up or introduce it i suppose what would you say is the appeal of this album in a word, it is mixture. Now, mixture is something that's interestingly a talking point on one of the tracks here. But the point that I make with mixture is that this is a very diverse album in terms of songwriting, uh, musical style, and the way it's produced. And I think the really diverse toolkit that this album presents of both moments of bitter self-loathing contrasted with moments of uh, joyous rebellion, dark, edgy post-punk tones, and more traditional, exciting rock. The mixture of these two elements is what makes the end like even the more uh, edgy singer-songwriter focused tracks versus more poppy accessible tracks. That, mm. that combination, that contrast, and the distillation of that kind of put together is what to me makes this record so appealing mm. that it's both of these two extremes balanced in a very intelligent way. Yeah, I would say that it is definitely the most diverse in sound of any of the national records, which is not to talk down any of the other records. Very much the MO from Blockstar onwards is that they find a particular niche 
for each record and kind of just sit within it i guess maybe the one that varies the most from that is sleep well beast maybe which is a bit more sort of loud quiet in certain ways but for the most part the albums and the kind of the way i think they're known in general is for a particular sort of gloomy moderate tone with a kind of bit of a propulsive underpinning rhythmic bent to it that gives them that edge i think they lean further into that rhythmic aspect of the sound here into that sense that the songs could really go anywhere from where they start out the album itself has an unusual structure where you can't really cleanly divide it into halves or thirds or even quarters it kind of meanders a little bit but it does that in a way where it feels like it has direction and you're kind of pulled along from song to song in a certain way until you get to a certain point in the record where it feels like you're kind of locked in place and sort of heading down on this roller coaster of emotions that you can't escape it's a really strange album to try and quantify my feelings about especially compared to other national records because it is so unusual in the way it kind of progresses and and establishes itself yeah and all that i think is laid out really really beguilingly in the opening track secret meeting which starts with this kind of massive uh drum hit and just you instantly have these kind of disorienting arpeggiated uh twinkly guitar chords that are just sort of meandering and echoing in the space and it almost feels like the second it starts it feels chaotic before you can kind of get your head around what's happening and the rhythm is very unusual as well and One of the interesting things about this record too, I would say more than most other national records is the way that Matt's voice sounds and is placed in the mix. He's kind of distant a little bit, not super distant, but there are points where he does feel almost as though he's being overpowered and they kind of lean into that effect to a particularly strong extent on this opening track, which actually is a masterstroke because it oh, yeah. it mirrors and kind of complements what the song is actually about and the kind yes, of sentiment yes. the song is getting across which is this idea that your inner voice essentially your brain is so swirling with thoughts and with um concerns and worries and anxieties essentially that the metaphor of having a secret meeting in the basement of my brain where i'm not invited essentially is all of your unwanted anxieties and and worries and insecurities kind of conspiring against you and they sort of represent this musically with this like cacophony of uh these backing vocals uh shouting this nonsense line of i'm talking ace this morning which has long been Mm. debated exactly what's being said but i'm pretty sure it was confirmed to be i'm talking ace this morning I think the backing vocals are a particularly strong feature, not only on this track, but on the album as a whole. And I think it's also important that you mention the uh, vocals of Matt Berninger. Uh, His vocals do a great job of kind of emulating the the record's kind of structure and really understanding that helps to unlock why this album is paced and structured the way this is, because it's this drunken stupor through a montage of emotions that happen so fast you can barely parse one from the other and and process what's happy what's sad what's Mm. fun what's terrifying it's it's a really ingenious way to combine the production of the album with the actual core and structure of the album so i i really like details like that or just just the way his vocals are mixed and presented really adds so much to not only the experience of this first song, but of just the whole album and the way it plays out. Mm. If I can make a particularly uh, August-like comparison here, these first three national albums are like stages of evolution of a Pokemon. Like we have the national self-titled, which is, you know, it's, you know, there's some there, it's a little, it's a little weak. It's a kind of, kind of the baby of the three, but you know, there's, there's potential, there's promise there. Then you get the 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 awkward middle child stage, which is you know significant more uh, uh, punch, uh, more usefulness, but it's still not quite maybe not quite living up to it the the, the full potential that was uh, hinted at having. And now we have fully arrived at the point where I feel like the Nationals' identity has kind of congealed together. I feel like uh, 
the sort of word that August uses mixture. And I would say that the word here is synergy in the, the this first track, of course, it complements musically with what it's doing uh, thematically. So you sort of get immediately hit. And I think the next album too also does a very similar thing with its opening track and a lot of its musical qualities and how they sort of blend together to sort of reach this point where it puts you into the headspace of the characters that it is talking about. And it also just kind of gets to the point where we fully realize this sort of idea of the nationals, what their like interest in like writing is about, about how, you know, on that first album, there's sort of a blend of kind of irreverence and like genuine emotional stuff. And then on sad songs, they, well, I mean, as the title kind of implies, they lean a little bit more into the dourness a bit. Um, you know, not that it's completely like that, but here there is actually a lot of humor on this record. And unlike the self-titled, I don't really feel like any of it sort of misses. Uh, and even then when it's not humor, it's just sort of odd little like writing quirks that make you feel assured that this band A knows what they're doing and is implying a little bit more depth in everything. And mm -hmm. I love a lot of the songs on uh, Sad Songs for Dirty Lovers, but there is a sort of two dimensionality to them that I feel like isn't like you might not be aware of the fact that they're a little bit more monochromatic so to speak until you get to this album which is a really interesting portrait of this idea that they've been getting at it's the full realization of this very quintessential American ideal that is sort of just like the apex of their early career for me. And it sort of blends it with like the last album, you know, you still had Peter Cadis, but there were a lot of instrumental tones and ideas like the electronic elements, which were a very appreciated texture to those songs. But here, everything just feels so at peace with itself. Every like instrumental choice is beautifully interwoven into each other to the point where instrumentally speaking, this is, basically a faultless album and to the point where like they sort of stretch for that further kind of edgier post-punk sound but there's still an ornate kind of beauty to everything like those guitar arpeggiations on uh the first song but i also think this is the first album where you can properly appreciate one of the best qualities of the national which is brian devendorf's drums the rhythms are just so sneakily complicated and you don't really realize that until you like really have to dissect this album uh with like the intent of trying to understand mm -hmm. what the band is doing emotionally while what they're doing like instrumentally and how these two things connect together yeah listening to this record really like more than maybe any other national record it's kind of their bit but like it feels like you're drunk while you're listening to this it induces a state of kind of intoxication and disorientation and if you listen to it while drunk particularly wine drunk as the band kind of allude to in more detail and specifics later on you really get a sense of how cannily powerfully it evokes that landscape that headspace there's the inflated confidence but there's also like the sense in which everything is inflated mentally both your confidence and your vulnerability the whole album exists in a state of heightened confidence and heightened vulnerability where you're kind of veering in an almost bipolar fashion from one extreme to the other depending on the moment and that can be one of the things that makes the album feel you know, unwieldy structurally, but it can also be one of the things that holds it together as a kind of piece of connective tissue. So Secret Meeting, I think, really starts out basically evoking a manic episode, essentially. You know, you have all of these overlapping thoughts that are happening inside of you, all this push that's pushing you forward, and you don't know how to deal with that. One of the things I like about the song is the way that the kind of chaos of what's happening musically is sort of contrasted by how sort of forlorn and soulful Matt sounds as a singer. Like as he goes on throughout this discography, he'll he'll perfect that kind of brogue uh, baritone voice of his. But here he kind of like, and it's true of the last two records as well, but it's done better here. He kind of has this sort of like almost whiny sort of like vulnerable emotional tone to him. Like he just you feel like he's not quite trying to sing really well, just trying to sing really emotionally. Like the way he sings, didn't anybody tell you how to gracefully disappear in a room? Is kind of like 
messy, but it's it feels kind of satisfying to hear it in that way. Also, the way he sings, I know you put in the hours to keep me in sunglasses. It's almost conversational, like something he's saying to someone is just turning into a song. So there's this meeting point in the way he sings between like straight up conversational pieces of dialogue, essentially, that become musical through the way that they're expressed. And that's something I think he kind of shies away from on subsequent records when he becomes more of a conventional singer. And then you get into the song like Karen, which is like in a lot of ways, the total inverse of this first song. Uh, and it brings up another interesting point as well that's worth bringing up that I kind of forecasted in the last episode, which is that this record marks the first time that Matt is working as a collaborator with his longtime partner, Corinne Besser, uh, who would work as a co-writer of the lyrics and as a, often as a backing vocalist as well on this album and every single national album since. She's been an integral part of the songwriting process. They often write together, essentially, or Matt will write on his go away and write on his own. And then he'll kind of like consult with Corinne and she'll bring ideas to the table to flesh it out. And so she's alluded to directly with the song Karen, where her name is slightly changed. And this is a thing that Matt does a lot. Like he, one of his recurring motifs as a songwriter is like random female first name uh that he'll just like use as to to embody this like perspective where he it's this Slow guy dive tight beat it's this guy who's like pleading to this female figure in his life essentially i mean you know out. it's a good thing he didn't use his wife's real name for this song in particular because that would be a little <laughs> little awkward yeah well, well hey we're not at corinne at the liquor store yet yeah he does use her real name on sleep well oh, Beast, but, but that's certainly wow. uh a less bitter song than this one uh i i love this song it's a little one of the less access, accessible or immediate ones especially because of how meandery parts of its musical progression are but i just love how unsettling it becomes at certain points i think there's a really bitter humor to just this desperate pleading for basically this uh alcoholic guy pleading with his wife girlfriend uh romantic partner however you want to frame it in your head basically to stay with him after a lot of basically abusing her a ton and it's it's all done with this very particular irreverence like with the the cock in hand line yeah a lot of the vulgar sexual stuff on this lends a really great brand of just hilariously morbid humor to this song and i just find it an absolutely endearing track on here it's a really pathetic song you're right like oh, in terms of yeah. the perspective it's it's like utterly like self-immolating and i like the way that because we've got another really unusual time signature on that chorus as well like the way that that line the, the singing sort of meanders and kind of just a line will cut into a next line and like, I love the use of unusual time signatures and the vocal melodies here because it evokes that sense of like rambling, drunken rambling, essentially, whether you you're not really able to coherently form. You alone into America. Like that, that like belabored line always gets me. Yeah. And also I want to say as well, this is a good excuse to bring up another one of the strengths of this record and a way in which the songwriting is continuing to strengthen is that a lot of the songs on this record make take full advantage of the power of a really great bridge and the band get really really good at writing them this like extra thing that happens uh towards the end of a song that takes it to a new place before returning home and the band really take advantage of that structural piece of a song to introduce a new musical idea to keep things interesting to keep things moving in a, in a certain direction to sometimes make it a little bit more disorienting as well like i think this one does but yeah, it's just a song that you kind of have to surrender to a little bit and just kind of let it take you to certain places. But uh, it's very funny in a very sort of like pathetic way. And I have always um, been fond of, I mean, you've alluded to it, but it's worth quoting in full. Um, it's a common fetish for a doting man to ballerina on the coffee table, cock in hand. I mean, just let's appreciate the, you know, the assonance, and the alliteration of that line, how well it's structured, how well it's, how satisfying it sounds for something that is so ludicrous. Uh, it's really, really funny. 
I also like the the dark implication of the the line that I mentioned earlier. The you don't want to go out alone into America. It's like th this sort of very you know abusive notion of it's just like oh well the world is scarier than I am. You don't want to go and and hide out there when you you could be in here where I will hurt you slightly less than all of the terrifying things that are in the outside world. So it, it showcases a really like it sort of uses that sort of delivery to hide this really like lumbering belligerent kind of terrifying sentiment that uh, August sort of alluded to that there is like a lot of nuance and depth on this album to its writing that you can sort of file through and find some really those like again super uncomfortable um, but also sentiments that comment on like the context on which these uh, people exist in the state of like modern America and what have mm. you. Yeah, there's occasional lines as well that like emphasize how dissociated this character feels from who they ostensibly are as well. Like when he says, I'm living in the target shoes and when he repeats, I must be me, I must be me. It's quite like, it really gives you this like quite potent and powerful sense of what it's like when heavy intoxication is your norm and is the state you need to be in to feel like you are yourself essentially. And, you know, it's without wanting to labor about how this record, you know, powerfully captures the nuances of alcohol addiction, which it does, it, it does that in ways that really sneak up on you, I think, and make it an album that, yeah, is really, really funny, is really, really charming, is really, really exciting to listen to. But the more you have it in your life, the more you realize how like below the surface, there's a lot of really gnarly and potent observations about alcoholism that especially if you've ever had someone in your family or known someone or even been someone who's experienced that then it, it does I think feel real uh, at least in my experience and then you get to lit up which again we're talking this bipolar structure of of veering wildly from this enlightened confidence to this utter despair where you're dragging someone down with you lit up is the you know it's the false confidence that that drunkenness initially gives you and the song you know is so propulsive and so kind of yeah. joyous as well it's definitely i think probably the single most uh, I guess euphoric moment on the album I guess it may be aside from the closing track but even here it feels like particularly like this person is untouchable whereas I guess on Mr. November it's like I used to be carried in the arms of cheerleaders where here it's like there's no holding this person back they are realizing what they're meant to be which is this inflated sense of confidence they have when they are lit up essentially mm. One of the great opening lines of any song I can think of is my bodyguard shows her revolver to anyone who asks. And yeah, she comes to attention when you come up to me too fast. I just, that line is so fucking good. It's a funny line. I like it a lot. And I think this song is another great example. It's like, yeah, that self-confidence. And you see that, uh, that like brief waver in the second verse there. And then he just springs right back into it. And it's this really exciting euphoric moment. I think on its own, the song is a lot more exciting feeling. Uh, and I think it's it's so great because in the context of the album, it takes on this other meaning of, yes, this false confidence that you see mixed in with all of these other emotions. So I think it I think it adds to this kind of uh, pathetic, grim humor of the record itself uh, when listened to in proper sequence. So really uh really great moment there and there's like uh in this inflated confidence as well you still have that kind of like this insecurity that has this character essentially still needing to you know reaffirm their superiority by like the whole oh, yeah. song essentially is still talking down on someone you're the low life of the party there's i guess one reading you could have where it's like he is essentially talking down to the morose side of himself and then empowering the the drunken like co cocky confidence side of himself that comes out through alcohol you could read it through that lens as well 
Um, I think there is a sort a sort of kind of a meta level to the song as well. There's that lyric in the second verse where he's like, nothing like the sound I make that only lasts the season and only heard by bedroom kids who buy it for that reason. Like that's a very meta line about like being an indie band and um you know the idea that you have yeah. essentially 15 minutes in the spotlight and then become tied into a particular era, which the national were for a while, and now they're kind of through sheer power of will, you know, become maintaining relevance in, in the culture somehow. But anyway, uh, it's it's a really cheeky song that continues, I think, the themes of both of the songs before it, but really emphasizes that divide between the person that this character is when they're sloshed, essentially, and the person they are in their real um, sober life, and which is a, a differentiation between these two sides of a person that gets more and more marked as the record goes on. Like you get certain songs that embody particularly that ugly soberness uh, more and more. And so it almost feels like in a weird sense that as this record goes on, the person sort of slips more and more into it. I don't know. That may be a little bit me reading it a little bit too much into it, but yeah. And then we get to Looking for Astronauts, which is, I'm going to say it, one of the most underrated national songs in general, I think. Hell yes. I never see anyone talking about the song. And I also say that because at one point it was underrated by me as well. I remember a time when I was like, not that into it. And now I just feel like, man, I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah, it's it's particularly low key compared to what we've already had. But my God, like the the drum yeah. hits that are happening in combination with those arpeggios mm. while he's singing the verses are so disorienting and beautiful and the chorus itself is so pretty and kind of unassuming but sort of also eerie in its own way and the lyrics and are just yeah. like gorgeous it, it's just another zag in the albums uh zigging through constant emotional just new emotion every track make it as as packed as possible with everything and it's great to me i always uh connected with this song a lot because it uh it feels like them kind of setting up later ideas in a very stealthy way like uh looking for astronauts is kind of the rec the first half of the record's answer to geese of beverly road i was having the same thought listening to this earlier august i'm so glad yeah. you said that it's got this same kind of bitter nostalgia almost. It's just a very pretty kind of comfortable feeling song. Yeah, there's this interesting comment from an interview with the band where it talks about the song and the idea of looking for astronauts being like looking for someone essentially who is not of this world i guess in a metaphorical sense that can kind of pick you up and rescue you from the situation that you're in and kind of represent a freedom chinese satellite perhaps <laughs> oh god damn god. it i was thinking it i was gonna say Shit. it but i was thinking it that's 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 beautiful <laughs> okay yeah now looking for astronauts is add that the to new... the fucking fiona apple um paper bag list of songs that are stealthily also chinese satellite <laughs> yeah this is looking for astronauts is now going to be the new chinese satellite in our favorite tracks and ratings um <laughs> damn it what have i done my three favorite tracks are chinese satellite looking for astronauts and paper bags <laughs> yeah <laughs> um anyway yeah beautiful beautiful song we talk about a lot of how this is a very gin soaked band and if this song provokes any kind of thoughts in me of like a a specific state of intoxication this is like a well-to-do suburban like family who are like out on their porch in the middle of the night like on a late summer night drinking like beer or wine or something and they're just like a little dazed and it, it just perfectly evokes that sort of serenity almost uh mm. just spe specifically with the guitar tones that are just so like otherworldly levels of pretty just like they are on the first track even it kind of echoes a lot of the same arpeggiated ideas that are on that first song and it sort of foreshadows the geese of beverly road a little bit that's kind of why um one of the reasons i think this album sort of holds together as the first like true front to pack like definitive statement of the band is that it really does feel like 
all of these songs sort of like the, the fact that this album is kind of formless and structureless is way more to its benefit than its detriment mm. is that it just sort of feels like a constantly echoing reverberating variation on itself and this is like the lightest part on the album for me that actually uh this and the following song are probably my favorite uh one-two punch on the entire record nice deep cut picks yeah i was thinking listening to this as well like one influence the band have been really vocal about in terms of being one of the biggest influences on them is rem and like while what rem do like i'm talking 80s rem are like is jangle pop and this is kind of more twinkly than jangly i feel like texturally there's some similarities in terms of how dreamy the guitar effects that they use make the songs in combination with lyrics that you know there is a stipe-esque kind of abstract quality to the lyricism it's not quite as like you know fully abstracted as michael stipe gets but there is a sort of similar sort of similar feeling to it on on this song um, but yeah, then we go into the first uh, stripped down, straightforward, I guess, ballads. Although it feels like every song on this record is a ballad in some sense. But the first kind of proper stripped back ballad where it's just sort of acoustic and piano with some very light touches of bass drums and toms and stuff from Brian, Daughters of the Soho Riots. Very uh, a light, but I would say essential touches. Yeah, a hundred percent. This song is, I think, one of the moments. I'm really glad this song exists. I love this song so much, but I'm particularly glad it's here because it's. It feels like this is a moment where you really get to soak in how powerful Matt is as a writer on this album, and also how tender he can be, and how well his vocal performances here elevate the tender poetry of his writing. Some of my favorite lines he's ever written are in this. Uh, I have your good cut clothes in the car, so cut your hair so no one knows. I have your dreams and your teeth marks, and all my fingernails are painted. Such like fragmented lyricism that evokes the early stages of a relationship. It almost feels like free association at points, the way mm. this song is written. And I think that that adds a ton to the record to have a song that feels so in its kind of just lyrical and instrumental passages so like free and just almost off the cuff it's a really great addition to the record for that reason and it kind of contributes to that aforementioned uh drunkenness of the record it, it's yeah just a really kind of spiraling spinny track mm. It's so like the way that information is doled out in this song is so very meticulously put together. Like it reveals itself to be, or at least presents itself initially as the song about, you know, escaping with a lover essentially. And obviously in the context of the record, it represents this, you know, sort of hangover state of like depressive realization that, you know, this is a cycle that is going to continue essentially. And this, moment where you convince yourself that you can escape it that if you make a critical decision right now you can run from it when all you're really doing is running from a problem that you should be addressing but as the song goes on you start to realize that he's not even talking about the person that he's with but with a person from another part of his life maybe someone that he had a fling with while he was in a drunken state or maybe an old girlfriend or someone like that and there is this distinction between my lover and the one I love which I love the choice to word that in that way because they are essentially saying the same thing so there's really like you only know from the context of the line break my arms around the one I love and be forgiven by the time my lover comes you only really know from the context of that line that those are two different people. But even then, you can't even be sure. There's an ambiguity to the way he writes. And the, those sorts of complicated meandering lines are beautifully contrasted by really simple and powerful lines, like everything I can remember, I remember wrong, which the more you think about that line, the more fucked up it gets. Uh, and how can uh... anybody know how they got to be this way? You must have known I'd do this someday. Again, that continually putting the onus on someone else. Uh, the randomness of things like, I don't have any questions. I don't think it's going to rain. You were right about the end. It didn't make a difference, which I always used to miss here as you were right about Vienna. It didn't make a difference. And I was like, is he talking about the city or the Ultravox song? Or what does that mean? And I was just mishearing it the whole time. There's just like this sense of 
false hope and despair in this song. Like, I don't know that I've ever heard a lyric that has described a particular feeling of attachment to someone in, your, in a weakened state that's as powerful as breaking my arms around the, lo- the one I love, like embracing someone to the extent that it destroys you. And that kind of toxic dependence is at the heart of a lot of these songs. But I don't know that it's ever on the album expressed as poetically and beautifully and, and tragically as it is here. I don't know. Jake, I know this is a favorite of yours. What are your thoughts? Yeah, this is my favorite song the National have made up until this point, actually. Everything about it, the incredibly ephemeral lyrics, the gentle, gorgeous instrumentation. One of the sentiments I find so interesting around it is actually the sort of idea of the title, The Daughters of the Soho Riots. Cool thing about it is that it kind of, just through that implication, sort of implies that, like, the generation that all of these characters belong to is sort of a a post generation of just like all of the important political strife that uh, birthed the world that their parents were a part of is sort of now gone so that now they're in this kind of American swamp of malaise that just doesn't like they're they're so utterly unconcerned with everything and the idea of them escaping and being comfortable is sort of like disappearing into the masses of people that are exactly like them they find no comfort in each other or even the the individual qualities that they possess but they find comfort in their ability to be invisible which is just like the most quietly tragic sentiment this band have touched on until this point. It's just, ah, uh, God, it's just a fucking perfect song. Mm. And again, we veer into mania with what I think is the most disorienting and unhinged moment of the album. I mean, it has some competition. I'll admit that. Uh, but for me, the song that upsets me the most on this record is probably Hmm. track six baby will be fine which is a personal like this is top three on the album for me this track i have listened to this so much this song is completely overwhelming for starters you have the drumming which is completely dizzying like lots of uh cymbal hits and just just real uh, emotion and and uh intensity in the playing of brian but also like it's sort of uh an atmospheric intensity he's not like super overwhelming everything else matched beautifully by those arpeggiated guitar chords again that we're so used to at this point and you also have the string arrangement as well shout out again to padma newsom who has who provided the strings in the most haunting moments of sad songs and is back here again doing some amazing work on the viola violin uh all kinds of uh orchestral stuff that you hear on this record is all padma and it's just overwhelming and the lyrics here as well this is deep there's definitely some of the kind of sardonic um you know middle class white employment situation type of humor that you got like really early on but here it's like matt's really find out how to tune it to be equally self-aware in the sense of how absurd and funny it is but also how tragic it really is for 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 him as well all night i lay on my pillow and pray for my boss to stop me in the hallway lay my head on his shoulder and say son i've been hearing good things like that is just so equal parts an amusing image and a fundamentally sad one as well. As is, I wake up without warning and go flying around the house, just imagining Matt Berninger flying around. Yeah, but just like, it it speaks to something that like we can all relate to, which is this idea of desperately, desperately wanting to be affirmed by someone else who you feel has it together. Uh, And the way that you convince yourself that receiving that affirmation will somehow solve your own problems. Uh, and it absolutely won't but it is this you know the idea that someone's you know most fervent wish deep down in their heart is just for someone to say you're doing a good job like that's it's painful and it's real but yeah he just keeps going the lyrics here are so funny and so like on point 
you, there's that flying around the house line and my seven yon fierce freaking out take a 45 minute shower and kiss the mirror <laughs> that line is so the real, way he says real. freaking out it's yeah. so fucking funny to me just like oh. i like also how that chorus refrain and then the first time you hear it the context of it is that he is t- saying it to himself essentially he's standing in the mirror telling himself look at me to his reflection baby will be fine all we got to do is be brave and be kind uh and then just again the most middle class white dude line ever but also i can't pretend for a second it doesn't fucking destroy me i put on an argyle sweater and put on a smile i don't know how to do this and like the way that that spi- that spiraling thinking essentially just leads to mindless repetitive apologizing for nothing in particular for like existing it's just it's everything rough, man yeah and then the second half of the song it becomes about a second person as well like trying to find release or escape through someone else through leeching onto them i need entertaining i had a stilted pretending day which is a great turn of phrase lay me down and say something pretty lay me back down where i wanted to stay just say something perfect something i can steal like that's a beautiful way of like essentially communicating lyrically the idea of essentially needing someone to that affirmation that you need to hold on to from someone else but but phrasing it as something i can steal just really underpins the i guess volatility of it or the you know the one-sided one directional nature of it and then again the chorus recontextualized as this now this person is instructing this lover to say those things to him uh, that they'll be fine and then there's just like an image that i literally is nightmare inducing for me uh, of this like it bungling it into this awkward sexual encounter that ends in just an absolute sobbing mess i pull off your jeans you spill jack and coke in my collar i melt like a witch and scream <laughs> like that's just oh. it makes me shiver and then just yeah the whole song is like perfect to me i, I think it's a very underrated song and I understand it to a certain extent because it's like it's fast paced, it's overwhelming, it's kind of repetitive, and it's very hopeless. But man, do I does this shit hit, and especially at the end of a long day when I can basically relate to every sentiment in it. So then we get to another sort of irreverent but kind of eerie moment that to me is kind of like the first half equivalent of the song City Middle, which I think is a better execution of some of the same feelings, but this is nonetheless one of the more kind of absurdist weird songs on the record that being of course friend of mine uh matt as a singer on this song is kind of doing this yelpy tone that makes him feel like particularly unhinged it's a really weird song sometimes it really really hits for me and other times it can kind of just fly off me completely but there are still moments that again because it's so fast paced you're kind of hit with dizzying image after image And so there's like, for every moment where it's like, why did you listen to that man? That man's a balloon. Okay. Uh, For every moment like that, you also have a moment like, I have two sets of headphones. I miss you like hell, which just hits like a train when it's delivered so, you know, casually. It's a weird song. It's a disorienting song. It feels like it very, it very much fits the record. But what do you guys think? I'll just go ahead and say this is pretty easily my least favorite song on here just because that sort of quality it has where it just sort of bounces off of you tends to be my reaction to this. Again, and that's not to say it's a song that's devoid of merit. It does have specific lyrical passages that are really evocative. And I think that's more or less the goal here. But there is like the vast majority of the song is just like, it's also one that I find just a little bit less musically compelling. Like the guitar tone on here is like kind of like weird and wiry and then there's that part where matt's just like yeah <laughs> you're just that's like... actually i think the most post-punk the guitar maybe sounds on this whole record where it has that sort of oh like, yeah definitely like classic post-punk sound where it's like really sort of bent i suppose is how i would describe it sounds sounds a yeah. little uh almost david bernie kind of talking heads ish a little bit like uh, Matt, Matt has a lot of instances where he will try to sell a really weird like lyrical or musical decision and like 95% of the time he pulls it off but the 
Me, 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 me. Oh it's, gosh, it's so goofy. It definitely bounces off me a little bit. I'll say that. I, I, quite honestly, it it kind of kills the record for me ever so briefly because it, like I think a lot of the record's humor up to this point, it's very witty and sardonic and a lot more uh, within your own observation and reading of the lines where this is just for me, it's just like, this is just kind of stupid. I, yeah, I really, it's kind of yeah. hard to get anything out of some of these lines. And like, I feel like other songs, they kind of make you work for it, but they're rewarding. Whereas this one is just kind of like, I don't really, I mean, like, again, that man's a balloon. I, <laughs> I, I mean, his head's full of air. Sure. He, he's, a, he's an airhead. He's stupid. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's the, it's a, a the bit repetition, of though. They say it, he says it like a, like a bunch of times. And so it's like, so if one aspect of this lyrical delivery or these lyrics don't exactly work for you, it's not going to work for you again and again and again and again. Respect the effort. <laughs> I think it's probably I, a universal yeah. low point, but I'd love to hear from some friend of mine defenders out there. I don't, I, I like the song a great deal. It doesn't sink the record for me, but it is a, a definitely a part where I'm a little bit, it's, it feels a little bit too quirky for the vibe that we're at at this point in the record. But nevertheless, Val Jester is next, the quietest song on the record. And I will say again, Padma Newsom, violin. Like it's subtle here, yes. but man, it fleshes this out just right. Like again, simple sentiments here. Uh, it's worth establishing as well for national lore that Val Jester is, or Valentine Jester is the name of Matt's uncle and is a specific figure who is referenced again on the Sleep Well Beast song Day I Die, but is introduced here. So there's some national lore. Uh, but this is, again, it's an understated song. It's a quieter moment on the record. It kind of is a little bit of an intermission before the record really rolls into a full steam ahead final stretch but i i do enjoy it for what it is and it has some quite affecting lines as well i always loved uh fill her coat with weapons and help her get it on because one day when she goes she's gone that's such a stark image it, it's kind of both a sweet and very uh kind of disarmingly humorous line on this uh particularly avuncular cut in the record yeah it's like it's letting someone like a daughter or someone you perceive as having less power than you letting them go into the world essentially and you know preparing and, them for that world by essentially preparing them for violence essentially it's it, this yeah. idea that it, you have no confidence in your own parenting skills and your own parenting abilities or this person who, because it's kind of a second person song in terms of how it's written. Uh, it, it, it's a very like one of the songs that I think most overtly comments on the sort of like, you know, capitalistic society that this very working middle-class sort of environment exists within. Um, but it, it root centers that in a quite a personal story of, you know, two human beings essentially that makes it feel a little bit easier to connect to, I suppose. And I think I like the way that as well, this idea of a father leading a daughter out into the world and then ending with this line that all the most important people in New York are 19, almost as like a reassurance that this mm -hmm. child will be fine yeah. because she's at this age where, you know, the world essentially does revolve around her. But it's also in saying that, a way that this person is trying to reassure themselves that their shitty parenting job is not going to matter when in fact it you know it probably is going to matter um so again it's you, you've got another song from the perspective of someone who has had a toxic influence on the people around them and is trying to talk themselves into believing that that no longer matters uh and so yeah it gives yeah. it that extra level i do appreciate that kind of uh connection back to the record although i i do think this kind of stretch in the middle it does land as one of the weaker moments in the record for me where i think the bookends of this album like last five songs on each end are both supreme and this middle section for me is a little kind of it feels like it's having a bit of difficulty in connecting those 
two ideas because I guess Val Jester always felt like a bit of a disparate character piece that it doesn't quite tie into the rest as well as it should, I feel. I can't say exactly what could be done to make this a, a stronger connecting point to the record, but, uh, you know, yeah. that's just how it goes no, I, I get it. Hey, I, I actually think I, I might agree with that, August, and I, I don't really think I really put that together, but it does kind of feel like, you know, th this idea of fleshing out, like, the real, you know, the, the familial element of the, you know, the American family dynamic that they're talking about is that this one just kind of sneaks up on you. A lot of what they've talked about before is very distinctly like romantic partnerships and like interpersonal relationships. And so this one is just, it does kind of feel like it comes out of left field. It doesn't feel as like uh, woven in, I guess, but I do still really love this song like musically. I just like how gentle and like kind of sinister it is like one of my favorite lines on the album here is uh uh take your time when you tell her how she lives in your blood which is such a a really evocative line but also one that's just like communicating how someone you love who is related to you is bound to you by blood but also you know draws on the double meaning of blood being you know a connection but also an indication of like violence or mutilation Jake, you know what that reminds me of? And I probably, you probably have the same thought is the Big Thief song Shoulders, which has the same lyrical yeah. idea in it about yeah. someone's yeah. Blood, blood, literal blood being in you and being able and to it escape. Just, them it for just that makes reason. me want. Hawk. Okay, now we can get into what I like to call the God Run. The last five <laughs> songs of this record, my favorite stretch of music on any consecutive stretch of music on any national album. And that this okay. is this is like omega mode <laughs> like we start with all bit. the wine which is top five at least uh national song for me i think this is in its construction a perfect song completely lyrically musically every single second of this is faultless i can't imagine anything being different to improve this song or make me love it more i think it is the up until this point at the very least maybe even beyond the peak of matt berninger's lyricism every line in the song is either iconic in a hilarious funny way or just completely poetically brutal i'm put together beautifully big wet bottle in my fist big wet rose in my teeth I'm a perfect piece of ass, like every Californian. So tall, I take over the street with high beams shining up my back. A wingspan unbelievable. I'm a festival. I'm a parade. Like, again, we're talking about like uh, parallels between the first half and the second half of this record. This is kind of like a lit up parallel to a certain extent because it is about mm -hmm. that inflated confidence. But it goes so much further with that idea than lit up does because it talks about that inflated confidence and it goes into more and more of how that informs, dictates the emotional tone of, and then kind of the outcome of a relationship in specific, like how being completely unhinged and uncontrollable in your alcoholic addiction destroys the lives of the people around you essentially while all the same making you more and more convinced that you're the only thing that can fix it and i like the fact that the verses are so verbose and just like completely run on with this these flowery bizarre metaphors and unhinged language. and then you just get to the hook and it's just all oh, the wine is all for me all the wine is all for me and i love yeah. the way he says it the third time where he's like and all the wine is all for me. <laughs> like he just adds the emphasis that it makes it even better. I'm a birthday candle in a circle of black girls. God is on my side. Like one of, one of the all time lines. I'm, I love one like, I'm so lines. sorry, but the motorcade will have to go around me this time. I love that lyric. <laughs> it's just like, it speaks to this level of like really specific, like white male entitlement 
that like you ride on when like you know annoying people are drunk and they just think they're the center of the fucking universe and that's what this song is it's about feeling that confidence and just coasting on the fact that not like you feel like immortal when you're this kind of buzzed like all the wine is all for me it's like it's not like even if you're not drinking alone it, the sentiment still carries of just being like well that's all for me bitches mm -hmm. it's and it's just so like bright and upbeat and even though it's it just it creates that level of like dissonance in you that you're just kind of like forced to reckon with in this song and, and it just it, it does kick off just a a particularly phenomenal run at its like highest point, which I think is really uh, suited to the album's structuring at this point. Yeah. Well, so even just before you get into the ending refrain, there's this little melodic turn that the guitars do after, um, you know, I won't let the cycles around when it's all like, you know, intense and it kind of just pairs back. And there's this little melody that I either Aaron or Bryce does that just like, it's like a little counter melody it's not even it's not enough to call it a solo but it just adds this extra flavor and that makes it really really devastating when he comes in with that i'm in a state nothing can touch us my love a song that completely wrecks me no matter how many times i hear it and then like the the why we call this a god run is not just because all the songs are great but the way they run into each other is really something like the way that abel just kicks the fucking mm -hmm. door down next like we talked about when we talked about sad songs about how the screaming that is like all over that record is so like intense and just takes you, my you so my off guard and it's absolutely in insane when it comes in here as well when i saw them live uh they played all the wine into abel and it was oh, like hell yeah fucking that's nuts. the record <laughs> yeah it was particularly it felt particularly rare as well because you know they had like four or five albums since alligator by that point but it was a real treat and the screaming is like i love matt screaming i wish he would i get i get why he doesn't do it anymore uh, but when he does, one of the things I love about it is how like kind of unintelligible he is. It's just kind of like a, a raspy set of sounds, but he, he <gasps> no, 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 no. syllables. He, he makes it into a hook still all the same. And again, it's like we've talked about, or I've talked about at least, how there's this theme on the record where you feel like a lot of these songs could be about one person talking to themselves essentially like the sober or the conscious side talking to the or i guess the like you know the ego and the id or the the drunkard and the you know the sober person the 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 addiction and the real person beneath that yeah. addiction yeah it's yeah no it's it's really like a melding of uh like this more primal instinct and uh you know the more rational part where the where the monkey meets the man <laughs> And it's, there's an obvious <laughs> Cain and Abel uh, metaphor that's used to yeah, illustrate this yeah. as well. And I think the whole song kind of works down that uh, whole lane as well. Like when he goes, you turn me good and God fearing will tell me what am I supposed to do with that? Which is a, a funny line, but also like an extension of the Cain and Abel story metaphor as well. This person who is trying to comprehend, you know, what good it would do him to submit to this other side of himself and yeah it's just really intense it's a really uh balls to the wall song I, I get actually my heart rate spikes in that part where he's like turn around turn around take me back I can't calm down because that just gets me like <sighs> right yeah <laughs> like internally yeah. that's and very very a powerful moment and if if we're looking at this through kind of the yeah Cain and Abel metaphor I think the the idea of uh, this yeah internal world and this idea of being kind of marked is something that's uh, subtly kind of stated on here this idea of you feeling like just the most i don't know like shitty like fucking terrible person possible with your mind just being all over the place it's a fun frantic song which brings us to the you know the this the song of this album i mean my again people at home might not know my favorite national song the geese of beverly road 
Yeah. I, I, I kind of baitingly tweeted the other day that this is my favorite song ever. And I mean, that's always a really tough thing to distinguish, but it's absolutely top three if it's not. Probably depends on the day. It's really like close between this State Hospital by Frightened Rabbit and The Sea's a Good Place to Think About the Future by Liz Capasinos. But this is the one for this band. This is like, you know... Cheery it, assortment of tracks there. This is like the moment we're... I don't know, like, I don't even know if I can describe this quite well yet. I mean, I might need to just turn it over to you, wow. August, to get into this first, because yeah. I know this is a I song mean, that means a lot to you, too. Yeah, I guess the best way I can describe it is uh, with a story, as a matter of fact. Uh, and I know this is a rare moment of August storytelling, so strap in, kids. So this this story takes place back in about... April of 2020, I would say. So the kind of anxiety from the pandemic was still very high. I had been locked in my house for months on end at this point, had not really been outside, seen my friends for a long time. And it, it was just a very miserable, depressing time. And eventually I just started messaging uh, they, uh, my best friend, you know, and we were like, yeah, let's... Uh, Let's let's go to the the local because we've got this uh, very intricate network of, of storm drains in Omaha that's uh, very fun to explore and it it went from us exploring it to just inviting even more and more of our friends until there was a a full party of us uh, kind of venturing through the storm drains that uh, that April day and. That, that was only the start of our adventure. Eventually, we headed over to the grain silos, narrowly escaping arrest for trespassing. And then <laughs> Sick. after getting promptly kicked out, we, uh, we walked down the street, the, the main road as the sun was setting, and we just started talking about what the future was going to be like and what life was generally going to be like because everyone was gearing up for college high school was coming to an end there was this maturity there was this innocence that was slowly starting to die in the friend group and a maturity that was arising by necessity and we just walked down the street talking about that and and one particular comment i remember that's kind of silly was just thinking about buildings and how there's stuff in every building and even though most buildings you'll never enter and they're physically unoccupied uh, for long portions of time the world is still going on and existing and throughout this whole conversation this long walk back home after a, a busy day of adventure narrowly avoiding the law this was the only song I could think of. It resonated with me. It, it stuck with me because it is precisely this feeling of, of the fast fading youth and just embracing that to the fullest. Who cares what happens? Who cares if you skirt the law a, couple, a bit, setting off the geese of Beverly Road as the song phrases it in a metaphor meant to evoke, uh, well, smashing car hoods and getting the and that experience is kind of what this song feels like to me this just indescribable nostalgic intrinsic connection to other people that is is what feels so essentially human and and that's what this song is getting at and it it does it all without really talking about it it's just about the feeling of feeling invincible, awesome, and like a total genius, being the, the heirs to the glimmering world, the, those who will inherit the beautiful, bright world before you. And even if there are problems in the world, they're not with you tonight and they're not with you right now. And, and that's just how this song feels. It is this amazing affirmation of life with this tinge of, of dark beauty to it. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing song. And the reason why I still listen 
listen to this album constantly because the moment where it's placed like on on its own this song is is brilliant but within the album it is this precision needle that strikes this perfect emotional chord after the the uncertainty and confusion of the album finally there's this this brief moment of clarity where i i just feel things make sense and it's awesome it's totally awesome and totally genius couldn't have said it better myself yeah there's something really that feels if i can risk being a bit pretentious kind of profound about the song when you immediately come in with the combo of clarinet and cello at the start uh, from Sarah mm. Phillips and Anlun Baden uh, oh, in the way this, that yeah. it kind of like it starts as this motif that kicks off the song and then it kind of disappears until the very end of the song when it kind of mm. recurs and it feels like you have arrived back somewhere where you began exactly. after being on a really long journey exactly yeah. you know and it it feels it's, it's that yeah moment of clarity within mm -hmm. the just dark uncertainty and this is one of the most synesthetic moments on the record for me as well where like the sounds and tones particularly the guitar really feel like they evoke you know like flashing lights and you know motion blur and all these sorts of things that i associate with this fictional experience um that i'm venting in my head that you've actually had that you get to have as a real a reference point which is awesome yeah, for me, it's like, because I have had this song in my life since I was a teenager, but it's almost gotten more resonant as I've gotten older. And first of all, that main melodic motif, the da, 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 oh gosh, it's just it's so, it's so catchy. It's like, it's catchy and perfect, immediate dude. there. It's so good. Yeah. And I just like the parts like when it gets into the glimmering world refrain and you just have like this bed of these gently twinkling <sighs> guitars that you're just kind of like floating on, like backstroke swimming on. It's just perfect. And there's some of the sentiments here as well, like wearing the blood in your cheeks, like red roses as well. It's a kind of, you know, poetic and sort of dramatic line that suits, it's kind of so like, on the nose in a way that really suits the sort of you know puffed up inflated sort of young late teens early 20s you know ego that the song is kind of all about and it's like a moment of refuge on this album in a lot of ways where because it's a really dour and a really dark record but it's like a moment where you know, I guess in the context of this whole set of songs, I suppose the person at the center of this record gets to reflect on a time where, you know, things like alcohol and all these sorts of stuff that, that is now this mire that they're swamped in was something that augmented, just something that augmented an experience or a time of life that was so critical and crucial. And essentially, you know, the realization that part of the motivation behind the addiction is the attempt to reclaim or refind that even though it can never be reclaimed or refound and so that's the tragedy of it i guess in the context of the album but just while you're listening to it it feels so untethered and like to any of the darkness uh that it might be adjacent to it just feels like escapism essentially and it's like yeah. understanding and leaning into like it's understanding that what you're engaging in is a kind of escapism like there is a certain element of fantasy to it but it's also like disregarding that not caring about it and still engaging in it for the sake of it anyway like you know um we'll get away with it we won't be disappointed uh, I love oh, the image yes. of um, having your hands covered in cake. Yes, I it's, was going to mention mm -hmm. that. That's uh, absolutely one of my favorite lines. And the uh, but I swear we didn't have any. Yeah, which it repeated twice immediately afterwards is is this great like it's this great moment of kind of I almost uh, like the way it's repeated. It almost feels like Matt's laughing at his own joke in a way. Yeah, it's a really sweet moment uh no pun intended 
Yeah, and I mean, I also like probably the most Matt Berninger esque line on the whole song is "Come be my waitress and serve me the sky tonight with a big slice of lemon," which I I, I love that that little twist as well. Like, serve me the sky with a big slice of lemon as well, just bringing back that motif of excess and alcohol and, and cocktails and all that sort of like the aesthetics of that whole world. City Middle, probably the gloomiest track in this final set of five. One I think has some of the most powerful moments on the record in it, like as well as some of the most irreverent too. Like it really takes you back to that, lack of seriousness that some of the earlier songs had it goes through several different musical stages as well which can maybe hold you people at a bit of a distance from it initially but really i think it grows on you and this song really gets under my skin to the point where i completely adore it now nothing terribly novel here in terms of theme or expression to talk about some classic lines that very much reiterate some of the themes we've already talked Mm. about uh, I'm on a good mixture. I don't want to waste it. I got 520s and a ton of great ideas. I like the way he sings, I'm really worked up. Uh, that's really funny uh, to me. I, I think uh, one of the best uh, humorous lines is, although humorous from a certain perspective, is I have weird memories of you pissing in a sink, I think. That's just like one of those examples of like, sometimes Matt will write a bad lyric, but he will make it good somehow yeah it's it's no it's stupid but the delivery sells it like he's he's in the zone also like what is does anyone like genuinely have any hypotheses about what i want to go gator around the warm beds of beginners (laughs) might mean like it kind of sounds like you kind of want to rolling it kind of sounds like, like someone gator? who wants to leech off of like the youthful energy of some people that remind him of an earlier time of his life, but it's so abstract and weird. And I don't know what go gator actually G- means. Jimmy gator from Paul Thomas Anderson's <laughs> Magnolia. I'm going to go go and gator. It sounds like some fucking like Danny phantom ripoff. I'm going gator. <laughs> gator mode. Gatorade. <laughs> like maybe. This, this is the Florida man's Danny Phantom. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, it's the only thing that remotely approaches a reference to the title of this album. So maybe the alligator represents something like, I don't know, maybe something predatory that, about the character of this album. Could be. Um, that, I don't I, know. I, I guess the idea of like, maybe like, I there's like some kind of sexual connotation to it of like an alligator and like rolling, like doing the death roll around with a warm bed mention. So yeah, I, I guess, yeah, as you alluded to earlier, maybe that could be like him trying to hook up with younger women. Yeah, uh, perhaps that's that's my best guess, at least. Yeah, it kind of just sort of the song kind of just simmers and oozes in this sort of unsavory space with these weird shifts between musical ideas and the verses and choruses and then again I spoke about this earlier the band are so good at great bridges I forgot to mention how great the bridge is in all the wine but so many songs have great bridges and this song as well like it suddenly turns from like irreverent and kind of silly to just sort of devastating I know it's also kind of funny as well because like on paper the lines parking your car you said I'm overwhelmed you were thinking out loud you said I'm overwhelmed it's like really on the nose but like shit man if I don't get overwhelmed every time I have to fucking park my car on some level then I would be lying to you if I said that wasn't the case like it's something that's so true about like how the most when you're in a certain place or in a certain headspace or when you just are a certain way the simplest of things can be overwhelming. And then it's brought back to that idea of the alcohol addiction with the line, I think I'm like Tennessee Williams, I wait for the click, which is a, oh, a reference God, to- I love uh, a reference Cat on to a Hot Tin Roof. Cat on a Hot Tin Roof as well. The click being uh, the feeling that I think it's Big Daddy feels when mm-hmm. he- uh, drinks a certain amount of alcohol and the sort of unsettling pervasive anxiety of his life disappears once the click kicks in essentially 
Um, but it's not even just that lyrical sentiment, but also just the way that Matt sings at this point as well. He sounds, he really labors it. Like, fucking Yuka, you said, I'm overwhelmed. It's a very repetitive melodic idea. But then when he kicks into the Tennessee Williams part, he's like, really, I think I'm like Tennessee Williams. I'll wait for the click. It gets quite, you know, potent, I think. And it just, it's one of the eeriest songs on the record. And I've come to really appreciate how it, sort of lingers in that eerie sort of strange unsettled space again this continuous run bulldozes you into mr november which i think considering how city middle ends is even more like a punch in the face when the song just kind of yeah. kicks and kicks mm -hmm. the door down straight away i i think of it as this just ultimate uh kind of final breaking of this character uh, or like type of person that's been portrayed so consistently throughout the album where they kind of finally have this moment where they're like man i fucking suck yeah <laughs> but it's it's like the the final form or like the logical logical conclusion of the sort of yeah alcohol induced manic sort of self-confidence and it's funny because it veers from you know that literal em embodying and imagining yourself as like a pr the, the next president essentially and what you would do in that situation and how you would you know that sense of confidence is like so strong and so powerful that it's just taken to its logical conclusion where you imagine yourself as the leader of the free world basically and i like that it's kind of even in that state while he calls himself you know the new blue blood the great white hope it's kind of his mind state is still about like kind of convincing people essentially that he yeah. can be trusted and can be believed in. And it's like, you know, the, the reveal of that, the reveal of the hollowness of that, even in this person's own eyes is again, another amazing bridge that part mm. where the song yeah. just kind of like cuts out and you get just a few gentle little uh, notes. And he says, I wish that I believed in fate. I wish I didn't sleep so late. I used to be carried in the arms of cheerleaders. Yeah. You you just see the character of this album absolutely just obliterated in this moment after this like uh I yeah, kind of ultimate power trip that comes crashing down on his face. And it, it's this great kind of sardonic moment to cap off the album. I I really like it. And not to mention, it's just another exciting blood pumping song. The screaming here is really great. It adds a ton of momentum to the song. I just kind of love the idea of ending this album on what, I mean, pound for pound is probably its most energetic and exciting song. It just sort of feels like it's building to a fever pitch and then explodes at the very end, implying a kind of, you know, the a, a triumphant collapse of sorts. And I love the opening lyrics to the, this is nothing like it was in my room, in my best clothes, trying to think of you, as if like he is rehearsing his like victory speech in his room he's so pathetic he gets drunk and pretends that he's uh accepting an award or, or uh you know at the inauguration of his presidency or something and it's just so like maybe though it's super exciting sounding which i think is like a best display of this album sort of bipolar dichotomous nature uh is that it's it's the song where you sort of feel like him as he's reduced to his smallest self but that's when the band sort of capitalizes on its like grandest conveyance of emotion. So it's it's a really unique closer in the Nationals catalog too, just overall. Like it's it's just a really like fascinating way to sort of end all of this. So I uh, definitely one of my favorite songs on the record. Yeah, and it just occurred to me as well. Like this is the only energetic National closer at all. Yep. Like all their other closures are quite downbeat, sort of. Uh, you know, exhales essentially, like uh, wrapping the record up. Beautiful. A like, more. Exactly. Whereas this is like the only time really where it feels like an album ends almost mid sentence. Like I love the way that the chorus kind of comes back again at the at the very end of the song. And it kind of doesn't need to, like, or it kind of it comes back again just for one repetition of the line, and then just kind of cuts out completely, like a final sort the of the musical push equivalent for it. of the Sopranos ending. 
I mean, it's, just, up. it's not quite that uh, abrupt but yeah it does end in that sort of well okay the album's just over uh sort of mm. way and yeah and it's fitting for a record that is as disorienting and kind of flitting from two extremes as this does yeah worth mentioning as well as an aside that uh this album came out uh, was came out shortly after probably the most consequential EP in the band's catalog, the Cherry Tree EP as well, which features all the wine as well as a number of great, great B sides that I love. Wasp Nest, one of the great sort of like stripped back, pretty but incredibly dark lyrically songs, uh, all dolled up in straps as well, would fit that description too. Cherry Tree, the song, which is probably mm. the most intense and violent and kind of panic inducing national song ever like that song feels like a panic attack and you literally explode uh and of course about today on the cherry tree ep which is probably the single most famous breakup song that this band had ever released this is just a stellar fucking release from the band like as I think my thoughts have demonstrated I love this album, but I love this EP as a project in and of itself even more. Uh, it's just like, and also just like the recent remastering of it is like essential, essential listening from this band. Like if you haven't, you absolutely 100% need to. I think uh, I think the one-two punch of like Cherry Tree and About Today is that like, that's just as good as it fucking gets, man. I know a lot of it's very common opinion I've seen a lot expressed by a lot of fans that about today is their greatest song so I, it's very well loved again another great example of Padma Newsom's uh, violin just completely gutting yeah. uh, on top of some of the sparsest lyricism that of like that song has very few words and they're all very very patiently chosen um, but also yeah. has the uh, superior version of Murder Me Rachel, in my opinion. The live cut on that album is just terrific yeah, shit. We did mention that in the last episode. Yeah, very great live version of that song. Um, and yeah, and like I said, I will. My favorite two songs on here, uh, discounting all the wine, I guess, because that was already on Alligator. But I really love the one, two of All Dolled Up in Straps and Cherry Tree. Like All Dolled Up in Straps, I think, is a super underrated song just really yeah. kind of sinister and it has some like great lyrical passages on it that I love as well there's like this as the song starts Matt's almost rapping <laughs> like it's weird he's doing this really <laughs> baritone thing like really low bit. key but he's speaking really fast with the cadence of rapping I think I saw you riding in a car you looked happy for a woman black fingers in your mouth and a white and a white pearl choker my head plays it over and over the way he sings as well, super kind of sinister. I think I saw you reaching for a glass with your lanky white arms. Nothing else moves that way. Are you kidding me? I saw, I think I saw you walking in the city hips like boys. The sun fell behind you and never stood up, which is a great, that's a fucking chilling line when he, the way he says yeah. that. Is, is, and then that part where he it kind of turns into this sort of mocking nursery rhyme sort of thing where he's like, oh, poor sky, don't cry on me. Did somebody break your heart again? poor sky don't cry on me are you gonna fall apart again when he sings that that are you gonna fall apart Great again stuff. part i feel personally attacked like i'm being mocked for my own You've like come into my home to do this to me <laughs> how I wanna, dare you i want to shout out uh wasp's nest as well because that song has some amazing lyrics as well you're cussing a storm in a cocktail dress your mother wore when she was young. Red sun saint around your neck, a wet martini in a paper cup. You're a wasp nest. And again, some amazing lyrics here. Your eyes are broken bottles and I'm afraid to ask. And all your Ugh. wrath and cutting beauty, Ugh. your poison in a pretty glass. You're all humming live wires under your killing clothes. Get over here, I want to kiss your skinny throat. Like he sounds like he's going Matt, to murder this woman. Stop in this song. Stop it's it, really Matthew. uncomfortable. <laughs> and then Cherry Tree, my favorite song on the EP. For starters, I think if you've ever grown up in an environment where your parents don't get along with each other, uh, this oh, song I think will, oh will hit uh, it will strike a particular nerve because it's like all about sort of the bitter domestic bickering that divorced or unhappily married 
parents do and what it kind of how, how, what the effect and emotional damage that kind of inflicts on young people having to observe it the repetition of lines like no one is asking so leave it alone leave it alone uh don't look at me i'm only breathing which is a line that i think of almost on a day-to-day basis because like that's so <laughs> I feel that so much in like on public transport or in some situation where I just don't want to be seen. Don't look at me. I'm only breathing. And then the way he just repeats, can we show a little discipline? Can we show a little discipline over and over Mm. again as the song kind of just boils over into this fire that feels to me like genuinely kind of triggering. I won't lie. It, it just makes, yeah, it brings back some of the most unhappy memories of my childhood and I will just leave it at that. Um, but yeah, about today, I, I circle back to this song. The, I mean, like most of the lines in the song are literally like two or three words and it's just brutal. Um, today you were far away and I didn't ask you why. That's the whole first verse. And he's and it takes him about 30 seconds to say it. Be, because let's be honest, if it was anything, if the first verse was anything more than that, it would be too much. Like settle down, Matthew. Yeah. I feel settle like down. the entire album plans by Death Care for Cutie is kind of like an attempt to write this song 12 times. Uh because the <laughs> Ben Gibbard as a writer, I think, borrows so much from the national in this mode, although they were kind of coming up around the same time. So they were kind of like they're actually interesting bands to discuss together culturally, but that's for another time. Um, but yeah, they both sort of hit a peak in terms of songwriting and cultural prominence around the same time in that mid to late 2000s period. But yeah, Cherry Tree is an amazing EP. Um, but yeah, let's wrap it up with Alligator then and do our favorite tracks and ratings. Jake, why don't you go first? All right, three favorite tracks. Got to go for my favorite, which is Daughters of the Soho Riots. Uh, then Looking for Astronauts, and then Mr. November. Uh, Least favorite song, pretty easily, friend of mine. Uh, Still want to note that I still think that's a decent song. This is the first national album that I think doesn't really have a miss on it. And uh, yeah, I give this an 8 out of 10. All right, August. Sick. Okay, so yeah, favorites for me... uh... Number one is, of course, The Geese of Beverly Road. Um, Then I'd go, I'd say Looking for Astronauts and Karen. Uh, Least favorite would be a friend of mine. And yeah, it it also gets an 8 out of 10 from me. It's just a fantastic album that captures a very particular kind of person very well. All right, and um, Morgan couldn't join us, but he wanted the record to state that he has it at a 9.5. Uh, I'm sure Morgan will undeniably be back for Boxer, which, spoiler alert, is his first national 10. Uh, my three favorite tracks are The Geese of Beverly Road, followed by All the Wine, followed by Baby Will Be Fine. Um, and a least favorite is, yeah, probably a friend of mine if I had to pick one, but I don't have a least favorite really because there's no skips. And it's a 10, uh, one of my 20 favorite records of all time, if not even higher than that. Which means overall we get an average of 8.9 for the Nationals Alligator. Let us know at home what Alligator means to you, what your thoughts are on where this record ranks in the Nationals catalog, our interpretations of this album and of particular songs, any feedback, thoughts, perspectives that you have, do not hesitate to hit us up in the comments below and we'll be very receptive. We love to hear from you guys, especially other national fans out there who have opinions on our takes or just your own personal stories or experiences with this very special album. Please remember that if you enjoyed the video to give it a like and subscribe to the channel if you have not already. Both of those things help us out an awful lot. Plus, if you want to support us directly for just $1 a month, you can hit the join button, become a member of the Jams and Tea family, get your name featured in the title crawl of every video on this channel. Plus, if you want to recommend us some music to listen to and give feedback on, your recommendation will go to the top of the pile. As always, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago. Grey Goose, Fly Beyond.